We were talking about the characteristics of the spiritual world, and one of the characteristics we found is that in order to dwell in the spiritual world, you need to deprive yourself of a certain amount of the physical world. And now I say a certain amount because you don't need to deprive yourself entirely of it. But Baha'u'llah says you need to somehow withdraw from a certain amount of the physical senses in order to partake of the spiritual senses. And then he says that one of the phenomena that's the most mysterious of the signs of God amongst men is the dream. And I'm going to read this a little more. He says, Behold how the thing which thou hast seen in thy dream is, after a considerable lapse of time, fully realized. Had the world in which thou didst find thyself in thy dream been identical with the world in which thou livest, it would have been necessary for the event occurring in that dream to have transpired in this world at the very same moment of occurrence. Were it so, you yourself would have borne witness unto it. This not being the case, however, it must necessarily follow that the world in which thou livest is different and apart from that which thou hast experienced in thy dream. This latter world hath neither beginning nor end. Now he's talking about the dreaming world as if it's a real world, it's reality. Of course, a lot of us think dreaming is just some imagination, some creation of our mind. But Adabaha, or this is actually Baha'u'llah, he refers to it as a place of reality that has no beginning nor end. He says, it would be true if thou were to contend that this same world is as decreed by the all-glorious and almighty God within thy proper self and is wrapped up within thee. It would be equally true to maintain that thy spirit, having transcended the limitations of sleep and having stripped itself of all earthly attachment, hath by the act of God been made to traverse a realm which lieth hidden in the innermost reality of the world. This is what he says is true, that when you dream, your spirit transcends the limitations of the physical world Stripped of earthly attachment, it traverses a realm which lieth hidden in the inmost reality of the world. And then he says, Verily I say, the creation of God embraceth worlds besides this world, and creatures apart from these creatures. And he goes on to explain. So he says somehow, when you dream, you go to the real world. This is an irony of the dream, is because when we wake up from a dream, we say, oh, that was but a dream and now this is reality. But in fact, what actually happens is the reverse. Oh, that was reality and this is now a dream. Okay, if you understand what I'm talking about. I don't want to blow your mind here, but that's really what happens every morning when you wake up. You say, oh my God, that was but a reality. This is a dream. <laughs> okay, you can't really say that, but that's really what Baha'u'llah said. Now, the interesting thing is, is that we know a lot in the last 40, 50 years about the physiology of dreaming, what happens in the body when we dream. First of all, we know by studying humans in laboratories, it's very easy to study dreaming because you just tell people to come and sleep in the laboratory and you put various uh, scientific equipment on and you study them. We find that human beings sleep in an average 70-year lifespan. You sleep for 24 years of your life. You just take eight hours a night, and you'll find that most people sleep around 24 years of their life. We're asleep 24 years of our life. Between 20 and 25 percent of that, uh, we dream. We dream that much. We dream, you know, between 20 and 25 percent of our sleeping time, which means that you dream between five and six years nonstop in your life. Five and six years nonstop. Furthermore, we find that dreaming occurs only, or not only, I shouldn't say only, but predominantly in a certain stage of sleep. Sleep goes through stages. It's a 90-minute cycle, and you might have you know, five, four or five of those in a night. And those stages are characterized by certain physical conditions and certain brain waves and so on. They can be studied and analyzed. 
And in each of the successive stages leading up to dreaming, physical senses become turned off more and more. So if you go to the first stage of sleep, your sense of touch and your sense of hearing and your sense of vision are somewhat turned off, but not too much. So a certain sound you can't hear and you won't be woken up and I touch you and you can't, and then you go into a lower stage of sleep and then I can touch you a little harder and you won't wake up. I can make a sound louder and you won't hear it and so on. Do you understand? Your physical senses are diminishing as you go through these stages. And you go through a third stage and your physical senses diminish even more and you go to a fourth stage. Finally, you get to this last stage and it's actually classified as paralysis. Your physical senses are virtually shut off. During this particular period of time, your sense of hearing is very, very limited. You can, you can honk something louder and you can't wake something up. You can touch them harder and you can't wake them up. Uh, you can put a smell in the room. They've tried every sense and all the senses fall to their lowest point at this one time, which, they, which is this, the stage that dreaming occurs. Now, this is very strange because while they study the physical body and they find that there is no way any sensory input can go into the brain from the physical world. Because basically we know that the brain is active when it has sensory input. The, uh, the optical nerve, in fact, one third of the brain, I think, processes the optical nerve or something like that. But the optical nerve sends things, the hearing sends in. the, the te- And so the brain gets a lot of stimulus and is very active as it receives information from the five senses. And gradually these five senses become weaker and weaker until they're virtually turned off. In fact, scientists will tell you that during the the period of time that you dream, the 20% of your sleep time, you are the closest thing to dead that you will ever be until you die, unless, of course, you go into some kind of coma, comatose state or something like that. But you're very close to dead. Your physical senses are not working. Now you say, okay, that's interesting, but why would it be that this is when you dream. So originally, today they call the period of the dreaming sleep, they call it REM sleep. And that's because they found that your eyes move very rapidly and it's rapid eye movement stands for REM and it's called REM sleep. But one of the earlier terms, which is still sometimes used, is they refer to this as paradoxical sleep. And the term paradoxical sleep was very commonly used in early dream research because in addition to studying the physical senses, they studied the electrical activity of the brain. You know, the brain, when it's active, actually sends little electrical signals, and these can be measured quite simply. And they find that as you doze off, the electrical activity slows down. Okay, and then you go to a second stage, and there's even less brain activity. And then you go to the third stage, there's even less activity. You go to the fourth stage, less. And then suddenly you get to this paralysis, and suddenly the brain becomes just as active and often more active than even waking. And they said this is paradoxical. That's why it was called paradoxical sleep. Because they said, how could it be that when you have nothing coming in from the physical senses, the brain is as active or even more active than it is in waking life? What is stimulating it? Where is it coming from? And of course, science can't answer this question. And they say call it paradoxical sleep. And of course, if you give a good name to something, then you think you understand it. But when you give a name paradoxical sleep, you're basically admitting that you don't understand it. But we understand what it is by what Baha'u'llah says, is that your soul is going there. And the soul can communicate with the brain, as Adabaha says, through the common faculty. And so suddenly we realize that when you turn off the body, the spirit turns on because this is what happens every night. We can study it and learn it. And he says, this is one of the great mysteries of God. Every night you turn your physical senses off, your spirit roams. And suddenly we imagine that the brain is kind of like a train station. We'll call it Grand Central Station. A train station, or you can call it a brain station if you're kind of being... And you can think that this station has five trains coming in. Let's say they're coming in from the west. And these five trains that come in from the west 
are the sense of hearing, touch, smell, you know, all the five physical senses. And they come into the brain all of the time. And then there's five trains that come from the east. I'm just making up east and west. And the five trains that come from the east, okay, uh, they come from a different realm. But Adbaha says they come through this common faculty. And it, it appears as if, by scientific study, that as long as this, this train station is full of passengers getting off the five coming from the west, the eastbound trains don't come too much. They don't come too much. And then when the, they you know, put the stop on the tracks and close the tracks down for the night, then all these eastbound trains say, oh, let's go and get into the station. And they go get in the station and we can measure the activity. And so you can see it's like this. And so suddenly we realize that sensory deprivation, which is forced upon us physiologically by the sleep state, causes the dreaming. Now, it's not always that you dream in that state, but the majority of all dreams are in that what we call paradoxical sleep or REM sleep. Consequently, we know that sometimes when you deprive yourself a certain amount of physical sensation, you can use the spiritual powers greater. We have to stop some of those trains coming from the West and say, hold on, save some of the platforms for my eastbound trains. And how many of us are sending too many westbound trains into our brain station? How many are... We're, we're, we're putting... There's no room on the platform for these eastbound trains. And the only time it happens is when you're dreaming. Now, of course, many spiritual teachings are based on the concept that a limited amount of sensory deprivation will give you spiritual vision. For example, fasting is a fundamental principle of every religion and always was and always will be, according to Baha'u'llah. And fasting is nothing but just a small amount of physical deprivation, not particularly much, if you have to agree. It's just a sense of taste or eating, and you're only not doing it while the sun is rising. And yet, uh, it says here, fasting is essentially a period of meditation and prayer, of spiritual recuperation, during which the believer must strive to make the necessary readjustments in his inner life. He says, fasting is symbolic and a reminder of abstinence from selfish and carnal desires. So just the act of having a symbolic taking away of just a tiny amount of physical sensation leads to spirituality. How many of you have felt the capability, your spirituality, just from not eating? Just... The deprivation of one sense, only part of the day, and yet for some reason it has an effect. So such like dreaming also causes that. Another one, Adabaha says, is that meditation, which is the ability to use the second spiritual power, the power of reflection. Remember we said that there's imagination, reflection, and so on. He says meditation can only function if you turn off the sense of hearing, of physical hearing. Okay, I'm going to read this because it's very important, because Baha'is are told we should meditate, and Adha Baha has actually told us at least one of the things that is required for meditation. Adha Baha says, Baha'u'llah says there is a sign from God in every phenomenon. The sign of the intellect is contemplation, and the sign of contemplation is silence. Because it is impossible for a man to do two things at once. He cannot both speak and meditate. So when they say silence is golden or the sounds of silence or whatever, Adabaha is saying there is an enormous power in silence. He goes on to say, It is an axiomatic fact that while you meditate, you are speaking with your own spirit. In that state of mind, you put certain questions to your spirit, and the spirit answers. The light breaks forth, and reality is revealed. You cannot apply the name man to any being void of the faculty of meditation. Without it, he would be a mere animal, lower than the beasts. Through the faculty of meditation, man attains to eternal life. Through it, he receives the breath of the Holy Spirit. The bestowal of the Spirit is given in reflection and meditation. The spirit of man is itself informed and strengthened during meditation. 
Through it, affairs of man, which he knew nothing of, are unfolded before his view. Through it, he receives divine inspiration. Through it, he receives heavenly food. All of these things you can only achieve in silence. Total deprivation of one sense will only give you these things. And Adabaha says it's not even possible to get these things without meditation, and it's not possible to meditate without silence. Meditation is the key for opening the doors of mysteries. In that state, man abstracts himself. In that state, man withdraws himself from all outside objects. You see, sensory deprivation. He withdraws himself from all outside objects. In that subjective mood, he is immersed in the ocean of spiritual life and can unfold the secrets of things in themselves. To illustrate this, think of man as endowed with two kinds of sights. When the power of insight is being used, the outward power of vision does not see. This faculty of meditation frees man from the animal nature, discerns the reality of things, and puts man in touch with God. This faculty brings forth the invisible plane of the sciences and arts. Through the meditative faculty, inventions are made possible, colossal undertakings are carried out. Through it, governments can run smoothly. Through this faculty, man enters into the very kingdom of God. So it's a fairly powerful faculty, isn't it? The second spiritual power, which is the power of reflection. And yet Adivaha says it can only work in silence. How many of you even have silence in your life? Even a few moments. There's many people that don't. You know, Baha'u'llah, he loved nature. He went to the garden, what they call the Rezvan Garden, and he was quoted as saying that the city is the place of the body and the country is the place of the soul. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact, you know, Beethoven, he lived in a very rural environment, just a tiny town, but he couldn't compose. He had to go out of there and into the woods before he could write. He went deep into the woods to compose. He had to get away from it all, and he already was away from it all. He had to get away from getting away from it all just to compose. But this is a particular power. So it's quite obvious that sometimes when you turn off the physical senses or deprive them to a certain extent, as in silence or as in fasting, that certain spiritual powers are awakened. Now, unfortunately, when I say this, I then have to immediately qualify it with one of the greatest Baha'i principles. And this principle is so important that it has to be stated here, even though it wastes time in the basic narrative of my talk. And that is that Baha'is are called on a principle of moderation in terms of limiting the physical world. There are some religions that they would take the quotations that I read you, like close one eye to the world and open the other, and they immediately say, well, let's completely forsake the physical world. Let's completely just forsake the physical world because that's what that quote says. And indeed, if you read some quotes, it seems to imply that you do this. But we're told in the writings that we cannot do this. That is actually called asceticism, A-S-C-E-T-I-S-I-S-M, and it's prohibited in the Octas, that you cannot completely do this. Now, many religions have sects where they go and live in monasteries or live in caves or live on poles or, or they completely forsake the physical world in various ways, and we're prohibited from doing that as Baha'is. There's a new principle that Baha'u'llah has given, and it's the principle of moderation. But it's not widely understood by Baha'is because it's generally bandied around in too many ways. But Baha'u'llah has a very definite understanding of the principle of moderation. The principle of moderation says that there are some things that you should do and must do and they are good up until a certain point and then they are bad. It's not a good thing always. It's not a bad thing always. It's a good thing until you hit a certain point on a slider and then it becomes a bad thing. And there's many things like this. He says, for example, civilization 
so often vaunted by the learned exponents of arts and sciences, will, if allowed to overleap the bounds of moderation, bring great evil upon men. Thus warneth you he who is the all-knowing, If carried to excess, civilization will prove as prolific a source of evil as it had been of goodness when kept within the restraints of moderation. Meditate on this, O people. So now he's identifying a principle that some things are good things and then they become bad. And you have to find, like if you have a fader that goes from 0 to 100 and you go to 27 and it's good and you go to 28, it's starting to get bad and so on. Now, this is true in physical creation, in all all things that we eat. Let's take salt, for example. Salt is something that today is the devil. If you read, you know, don't have salt, it'll give you high blood pressure, it'll kill you, and so on. You you have to agree, salt is like the big devil, you know, and you cut down on salt and so on. Your doctor will tell you. Now, this is true. But in fact, salt is absolutely essential to life. And if you don't have it, you would die. And originally, salt was as a very valuable thing. You, when you said you are the salt of the earth, that's because salt was valuable. The word salary means payment was because originally salt was so valuable that they paid soldiers in salt. Okay, so salt one time was the great thing and now it's the devil. Why is it? Because we took it past the slider point of moderation. You cannot say well, just cut out all salt. You will die. But you also can't say have too much. This is a very complex subject then because there's some things you can't just do away with. Civilization is like salt, Baha'u'llah says. It's a source of good up to a certain point. You have to agree, is civilization a good thing? Yes, it's good. Is it a bad thing? Yes, it is. It's moderation that determines the point. Now, there are many things in this world that fall in that category that they have a slider point, and you need to figure out where that slider is. Baha'u'llah says, for example, fleeting are the riches of the world, and all that perisheth and changeth is not and hath ever been worthy of attention. Now, if you just read that quote there, fleeting are the riches of the world, all that perishes and changes is not and has ever been worthy of attention, you might think, well, then we can just throw away the physical world. But what does he say? He says, has never been worthy of attention, comma, except to a recognized measure. You see that? Everything in the physical world you can partake of to a recognized measure. Here's another quote. Shoghi Fendi in Citadel of Faith mentions the immorality of the world and the evils of the world. And he says one of them is the craving for pleasure and diversion. But I, I, I skipped one word. He said the inordinate craving for pleasure and diversion. Now this is very interesting. That one word makes all the difference. If Shoghi Fendi had said one of the evils of the world is craving of pleasure and diversion, then a Baha'is would all say, well, we are not allowed to have any pleasure and any diversion because Shoghi Fendi said pleasure and diversion is, is immoral. But Shoghi says inordinate. And inordinate applies that there's a certain amount, there's a place on the slider, and it, you don't go higher. And, that, and, and when you go past it, and so the term inordinate or recognized measure, these are all other terms for moderation. And so what things apply to moderation in the Baha'i writing? So you type moderation in the quote, and you find that civilization is one. Adabaha says that your desire for food should be limited by moderation. He says you should content yourself with simpler foods, not as many different foods in one meal and so on, moderation. Adabaha says, interestingly, that teaching, particularly speech in relation to teaching, requires moderation. You say, oh, oh, no, no, hold on, hold on. We should just teach, 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 teach. Okay? And yet Adabaha says that teaching requires moderation. If you speak beyond a certain amount or beyond their capacity, it is as much a source of, of evil as it was good. Now, would you say teaching is a good thing? Can teaching be a bad thing? If you go beyond moderation. He actually uses it. Adabaha says that capitalism 
and the desire to acquire profits is good, but if the acquisition of profits goes beyond moderation, it becomes evil. Isn't that interesting? He talks about capitalism. He says that the desire to acquire profits is okay, but then it becomes bad. Now, I think we went way past on the slider on that one. You see? Okay. Shoghi Effendi, he lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things in Adonai Divine Justice that apply to moderation and so on. So this is a very important principle because this means we have to be mature. When I say here in this talk, you need to turn off and not look at the physical world, close one eye, I don't mean completely close it. Even though some quotes may seem like that, you have to take them in context. It means close it to the point where that slider belongs. Now, I don't know where the slider is, but you now need to look at everything in the physical world, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the time you spend, the things, and say, where is my slider on that? Is it at the point where it's something good for me, or has it gone beyond that and it's now something bad for me? And put it there. And if you put the slider there for all things in physical creation, then you'll be able to see the spiritual world. It's that amount of deprivation, not more. So the principle of moderation, I had to mention. I'm sorry it took me away from my main theme, but otherwise you might have gone home and said, Tom Price said we have to forsake the physical world entirely. And that's not the case. But how many of you feel that perhaps you're gone beyond the moderation in many of the physical things? How many of you do you think we have? Of course. We're way, way beyond. So we can pull that slider down. But don't eliminate it. That's prohibited by Baha'u'llah, and that's actually dangerous. Now, fortunately, some things he's given us somewhat, he's told us where that slider is. For example, in terms of material wealth, he says that if you give 19 out of 100, 19% to God, that purifies the rest of it. He says that in the Akdas. He says it will purify your wealth. So fortunately, we know where you know money comes. Just give 19 to God, and that kind of purifies it. I'm not sure if that's the only thing, but at least he's given us some kind of indication. But so it's like you know one fifth. So this, you put it at 19. Okay, you put the slider. But I don't know what all the other things are. You know, entertainment and uh, you know, all the all the various things where the slider goes. But he helped us a little bit in that. Now. We now see we have the physical world and the spiritual world. And do you feel you have a better understanding of each? The nature of each? Has it in any way changed your uh, frame of reference now about how you look at the world, that there's two out there? This is what we're trying to get at. Now, how do you get to that world? How do you get to that world? And so I look in the writings and I find that the concept of getting to that world has to do with the concept of transcendence. And the concept of transcendence is in every religion. Transcendence means that you somehow transcend. You go from one state of existence to another. And Baha'u'llah says transcendence can be achieved primarily through two qualities. He doesn't actually say it that way, but if you look at it, and those qualities are eagerness and enthusiasm. It requires those two. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at all the things that make man, man, that anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, and so on, look, that are unique to the human race, in other words, things that animals don't do at all, you could probably summarize them in five or six things. Each of them is an expression of transcendence. And let's look at some of the things that distinguish man. The first is what we call human consciousness. Human consciousness is something so unique to man. We say, I think, therefore I am, as if just your mere consciousness. Consciousness is a completely different being to the physical world. It transcends the physical world. The second characteristic that we find unique to man is the sense of imagination. Man has imagination, and the animals don't. Animals don't have this form of imagination. And it turns out that imagination is responsible for almost everything, all sciences, all arts, the man's ability to imagine. Imagining also is a transcending act of the physical world. Would you agree? 
You, you Suddenly you go to a place that has no physical thing. The third characteristic which defines man, according to psychologists, is the sense of symbolism. For some reason, human beings are able to think something can represent something else. We have this ability. It's called the symbolic language. And of course, if you read you know, Jung or you know, Freud and all that, they basically, their whole understanding of the human nature is based on that we have a symbolic tendency. So you can take a photograph perfectly, you know, in the highest megapixels, life size, and, and show it to any animal and they can't recognize it. It's, if it's not the real thing, they don't know. But a human can look at, uh, you can draw a hangman stick figure and say that's a man and we can figure out that that represents a man. And this symbolic ability is the only reason why we can create language. And that's why the animals don't have language, because they don't have the symbolic ability. Language is so fundamentally part of human nature that even babies will create their own language if you don't teach it to them. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, babies are neglected, like in orphanages, and if two babies are similar age and you leave them together, uh, they will create their own language. One baby will do something and, and say, blah, blah, and the other baby will remember that and do it and say it, and then gradually words just create it's inherent in human nature to symbolize and create this. Is symbolism not transcendence from one thing to another? Another characteristic they say of human beings, another thing that's unique to human beings, is what a sense of humor. Now, you may laugh at this. I'm joking. <laughs> but you, you may laugh at it, but in fact... Humor is a very, very serious subject and one of the most perplexing to psychologists. Still today, they don't understand it. It's very confounding what is humor and why do people laugh. And so a lot of study has gone in. All the studies I've ever read on humor are extremely serious. There's nothing funny about them. Uh, but basically, what they have found is that all humor, whatever form of humor you have, it's based on pulling the rug out of one reality and causing another. In some form or another, humor is always based on transcending from one form of reality to another. And if you analyze the way in which humor is constructed or jokes, you have to understand. It's very difficult to explain this. But basically it could be that this word is used in one context and not another, or this is a meaning and it's not in another, or this is out of... Um, this is uh, not appropriate, or, or, you know, there's various ways in which humor can manifest itself, but all humor is based on transcendence of one frame of reference to a new one. And it's the suddenness of it, the suddenness of the transforming of the frame of reference, that for some reason causes you physiologically to smile and laugh, and it doesn't matter what culture, what background, what age you have, it's universally human that you like this sudden thing. And of course, if you read any textbooks on how to write humor or jokes, they train you to hide for as long as possible the one reality and keep it there so it's very sudden at the end. It's a bit of hanky-panky, if you know what I mean. Now, th this is very interesting because studies have been done on even very small babies, and you don't even have to do studies. You can, you can test it yourself. Take a small child, and they love to be surprised. And it's very strange. And this is true in any culture. You take a little baby, even just a few months old, you go hide behind a couch and you jump out and you go boo, and they laugh. Now this is very strange. Why do they laugh? And by the way, don't try it on any animal, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't work, okay? Because they don't have this sense. But, but the little child, the little child laughs. Now why does the baby laugh when, it's, when you pull the rug from one reality to another. And then even more mysteriously, the baby laughs, and the first thing it does is say, do it again. And you say, how can I do it? How can, you, how can I fool you again? Now you know. It doesn't matter. You can do it over and over and over again, and the baby likes it. It's inherent in human nature to want to transcend from one reality to another, and for some reason God has given us pleasure in this to such an extent that humor is an expression of transcendence. Now, there's a very wonderful letter that the House of Justice wrote to a believer, and you can look it up on the Internet, 
in which the believer writes to the house and says, I understand from a Persian or something that there's one tablet in which God is referred to as the humorous. How can this be so? And they write to the house of justice. And the house writes back and says, well, there are, there are certain meanings of humor that could apply to God. But if you think about it, God is by far humorous because basically he is showing us one world and then when we die, he, he's going to reveal it and we're going to have that same sense of pleasure that comes from humor. In fact, God is the most great humorist and death is the most great punchline. Of course, I mean, it's very, very similar because humor is based on transcendence. Humor is based on... I mean, he's going to say, I got you good, didn't I? I mean, he, boy, oh boy, did I get you. But why is that funny? Why, is it, why do we like it when a frame of reference is suddenly changed? Why do we like to go to horror movies or why do, you know, and be surprised? Why do we enjoy it? Why do we like plots that have a twist? Well, why is it that, that, that the human being takes pleasure in transcendence? It's because... We need to transcend everything in the world from dreamings that is a phenomena, from humor, from imagination, from symbolism. It all teaches us that we need to transcend from one world to another. This is the fundamental call of religion, is to see the gorilla, if you understand what I'm talking about, to see that gorilla. Now, how much time do I have? I'm going to skip, I'm, going to sk- I'm sorry, I have, an et- I have eternity, yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm going to switch subjects just for a moment because I can't finish everything that I want to say. And I want to say that when we talk about frame of reference and we talk about vision and we talk about trying to change our frame of reference, I noticed when I looked at the life and work of Shoghi Effendi that this basically was his model in life. Shoghi Fendi was all about vision and all about changing our frame of reference. Have you noticed that about Shoghi Fendi? He tends to broaden your horizon. He tends to put things in perspective. Isn't that true? And so I was reading a little bit about Shoghi Fendi's early period as, as guardian, and I found there was one incident in his life that really showed how he had vision how he had a certain frame of reference. And basically, I think that his life, in a way, is a symbol or a parable for the kind of things we need to do. And this is based on Shoghi Effendi's great love, his abiding love for mountain climbing. I don't know if you know, Shoghi Effendi loved to mountain climb, and he did so almost every summer. Rehekinim says almost every summer for the first 17 years of his ministry. He would go to the Bernese Alps, Switzerland, and he would either mountain climb or what they call mountain hiking, where you hike to the mountains. And I think apart from being guardian and being a genius and brilliant and everything else, apart from being guardian, this is the one thing that he loved. And his love of mountain climbing is very, very interesting. And I want you to think about this very carefully. Think about a 24-year-old. He was you know, born in 97, and in 1921, he was only 24 years old. Think of some 24-year-old youth that you know. Okay, 24 years old, Abdu'l-Bahá is passing away, and he says to the family in Haifa, because Shoghi Effendi is in London, send for Shoghi Effendi by telegram immediately. And the family disobeys Abdu'l-Bahá, says, let's not bother this little 24-year-old kid. And they write a letter. In those days, you write a letter, you know, you forget about it. Okay? But Adabaha specifically said, send a telegram to Shoghi Fendi. And Adabaha passes away some weeks later, and had the telegram come, Shoghi Fendi would have had plenty of time with him. Shoghi Fendi loved Adabaha so much that Adabaha knew something. But also, Adabaha was going to appoint Shoghi Fendi guardian. So Shoghi Fendi doesn't get this message because the family thinks Adabaha doesn't know better. And Adabaha passes away, and they realize they can't now send a telegram to Shoghi Effendi and tell him he's passed away. That's the, you, that, you couldn't do it that way. So they send a telegram to another Baha. And they say, can you please you know, call in Shoghi Effendi and, and tell him? Uh, so 
he he calls Sh he calls uh, Shoghi Fendi. Can you come and visit me? He doesn't give any indication what's going to happen. And Shoghi Fendi comes to his office, and it just so happens that when Shoghi Fendi arrives and they usher him into the office, that he is down the hallway somewhere, not in the room. And Shoghi Fendi sits there, and he he just sees on the table Abdul Baha uh, on a telegram upside down, you know, because it, it was facing, and he sees that. And so he comes into the room and finds an unconscious Shoghi Effendi on the floor. An unconscious Shoghi Effendi was on the floor. And that's how he heard that al had passed away. So he goes back to Haifa and he says, he says himself to Riyakanum, Prices Pearl, that he thought maybe he might be asked to help unlock the safe or, or you know, something, you know, he might... Because he was a family, he, or he may have to sign some documents to transfer some kind of legal things as a family. This is what he thinks he may have to do, and his heart is broken. So he gets back to Haifa, and in early January of 1922, Adohad passed away in November, they open the safe, and they read it, and this 24-year-old student finds that the entire weight of the cause is on his shoulders and finds out that Adabaha had wanted to talk to him before he died, but had been deprived of this. And then immediately, the half-brother of Abdu'l-Bahá goes and forcibly takes the keys to the shrine of Baha'u'lláh. He's a covenant breaker, because he claims family ownership, and now suddenly the most sacred relic of the faith, the very dust of Baha'u'lláh's bones, is now in the hands of the covenant breaker, all within the space of a week. Shoghi Fendi, 24-year-old boy, tries to go to the government and explain it, but the government, uh, uh, they decide to take the keys away from them but not give it to either one. Now, at this time, it was very hard for anyone to accept this 24-year-old because most of the family were a whole generation higher than him. You imagine, you know, you're 40, 50, and this youth suddenly takes over Mahdi Baha, you don't understand. And so what they really wanted to do was that they tried to convince Shoghi Effendi to appoint the House of Justice. Okay? Riyakhanim says, it does not require much imagination to conceive the terrible shock this was to Shoghi Effendi. The news arriving after dark by a padded, excited messenger and all the believers aroused and distressed by the words because this is when the, the shrine of Baha'u'llah had been taken over. She says, the situation in which Shoghi Effendi found himself was truly crushing. Aside from his extreme youth, the beardless Oxford student, however dignified in his manner, refused to even pretend he was like the bearded patriarch everyone knew so well in Haifa. He didn't even try to be like al Baha. He says, Shoghi Effendi refused to wear a turban and the long orange robes the master had worn, he didn't go to the mosque on Friday, the usual practice of Adi Baha. He refused to spend hours visiting Muslim priests, and so on and so on. She goes on to explain that everyone felt that Shoghi Effendi didn't really know what it was to be head of the faith. Okay? They said, they said all of this added to his suffering and caused much alarm within the family. They secretly suspected that Shoghi Effendi did not really know what he should do and that he needed an older and wiser head about him. And the sooner the House of Justice was formed, the better for the cause. During March of 1922, Shoghi Effendi then gathered a committee in the Holy Land. This was March of 1922. And basically, I'm not going to go into this detail, but he gathered a whole bunch of Baha'is, and he had been convinced, or, or they had said, that unless you form some kind of body, you're never going to get the Shrine of Baha'u'llah back because they're not going to give it to some 24-year-old kid, but maybe if you form an organization, it's a, it's a body, you can get it back. But by this stage, Shoghi Effendi was completely overcome with grief. Abdu'l Baha had passed away. He wasn't even there. Then the whole weight of the cause was placed on his shoulders, and then the shrine of Baha'u'llah was stolen from the Baha'is. And Rehekadim says, but the strain of this was more than he can bear. And so we find that on 7th of April, 1922, 
The body enters the record that the guardian of the cause of God, the chosen branch, the leader of the people of Baha, under the weight of sorrows and boundless grief, has been forced to leave for a period of recuperation. And he left. Now, they wrote this on 7th of April, but Shoghi Fendi had already gone. It's not quite clear to me when he left, maybe in March or very, very early April. He left. And he wrote a letter to the Baha'is, and he said, He is God. This servant, after that grievous event and great calamity, the ascension of His Holiness Adha Baha to the Apa Kingdom, has been so stricken with grief and pain, and so entangled in the troubles created by the enemies of the cause, that I consider my presence here at such time and in such an atmosphere is not in accordance with the fulfillment of my important and sacred duties. For this reason, unable to do otherwise, I have left for a time the affairs of the cause, both home and abroad, under the supervision of the Holy Family, under the headship of the greatest Holy Leaf. May my soul be a sacrifice to her, until by the grace of God, having gained health, strength, self-confidence, and spiritual energy, having taken into my hands, in accordance with my aim and desire, entirely the regular work of service, I shall attain to my utmost spiritual hope and aspiration. Now, that letter arrived, but Riyakunim says he had already gone. He was long gone. And what happened was they took him to doctors in Germany, and the doctors tested him and found that he had no reflexes. He had no reflexes, and it greatly distressed him. So he went to the Bernese Alps, and Riyakunim says he went there, and he was mainly alone, and he started to walk in the mountains, very, very high mountains. And she said he would walk between 10 and 16 hours every single day. And for some reason, he found comfort in these mountains. Now, if any of you have ever, has any of you ever climbed tall mountains? There is something about the vision of reaching the summit of a mountain that cannot be achieved in any other way. I know because I spent some time in my life in, in New Guinea where we, we would climb mountains of 10, 11,000 feet, quite high mountains. And the interesting thing about the vision you get when you reach a mountain is that prior to reaching the summit, your vision is actually quite circumscribed quite often. You, you don't see much. And then suddenly you get to that top and you look out, and it is amazing. You just want to put your hands out and spin like your Julie Andrews in, 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 the, in the Alps. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't imagine the vision that one gets. So I think about Shoghi Effendi finding himself by going to these Alps. Now, she says that he went there so many times and he lived in absolute poverty. He stayed in this tiny little place that you couldn't even uh, get in. Shoghi Fendi was very short, and, and he only had one meal a day. He always traveled there third class and slept on the wooden planks of the train. In, in other words, total sensory deprivation, and he only spent the time in the mountains. And he did this until December <laughs> Nine months. Nine months. Now, sometimes the family would come and try and visit him, but they couldn't stay with him because he would take them walking for 10 to 16 hours <laughs> and they couldn't keep up with him. And he did it every single day. Now, Rahia Kanum says that virtually every summer for the first 17 years of his life, he returned back there. He needed to have this time of meditation and deprivation and somehow he was able to find himself. And it so happens that I think in November, around November, December, he came back home from one of his long walks. Sometimes they weren't walks. He was actually roped to a, a professional and they would drag him up the mountains. He even did those kind of things too. And he came back and his own mother was there, sent by the greatest holy in tears, saying, you've got to come back. And finally he did come back. And uh, in, in the Star of the West, on December 15, so he left sometime in March or early April, so count it up, it's like nearly maybe eight or nine months. It says that December 15, in the Star of the West, it said, Shoghi Effendi 
returned to Haifa on Friday afternoon, December 15, in radiant health and happiness and resumed the reins of office of the guardian of the Baha'i cause, committed to him in the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha. Now, he then started to write to the Baha'is, and he wrote many beautiful letters. I want to read you one letter he wrote fairly soon after he came back. It's written just about a year after he returned. I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to remember he's only 26 years old when, he, when he's writing this letter, and it's only it's within a year of his returning. And I want you to think about him composing this letter in the mountains, because this letter is all about vision. And he writes to the Baha'is, Surely now, if ever, is the time to turn our eyes inwardly, to bestir ourselves, to invoke the most great name, and standing together, summon to our aid and support all the faith, the strength and the courage that we shall need to meet our pressing obligations and discharge our trust. The plight of mankind, the condition and circumstances under which we live and labor are truly disheartening, and the darkness of prejudice and ill will enough to chill the stoutest heart. Disillusion and dismay are invading the hearts of peoples and nations, and the hope and vision of a united and regenerated humanity is growing dimmer and dimmer every day. Time-honored institutions, cherished ideals, and sacred traditions are suffering in these days of bewildering change from the effects of the gravest onslaught and the precious fruit of centuries of patient and earnest labor is faced with peril. Passions, supposed to have been curbed and subdued, are now burning fiercer than ever before, and the voice of peace and goodwill seems drowned in unceasingly convulsions and turmoil. What, let us ask ourselves, should be our attitude as we stand under the all-seeing eye of our vigilant master, gazing at a sad spectacle so utterly remote from the spirit which he breathed into the world? Are we to follow in the wake of the wayward and the despairing? Are we to allow our vision of so unique, so enduring, so precious a cause to be clouded by the stain and dust of worldly happenings, which, no matter how glittering and far-reaching in their immediate effects, are but the fleeting shadows of an imperfect world? Are we to be carried away by the flood of hollow and conflicting ideas? Or are we to stand, unsubdued and unblemished, upon the everlasting rock of God's divine instructions? Shall we not equip ourselves with a full and clear understanding of their purpose and implications for the age we live in, and with an unconquerable resolve arise to utilize them intelligently and with scrupulous fidelity for the enlightenment and promotion of the good of all mankind? Humanity torn with dissension and burning with hate, is crying at this hour for a fuller measure of the love which is born of God, that love which in the last resort will prove the one solvent of its incalculable difficulties and problems. Is it not incumbent upon us, whose hearts are aglow with love for him, to make still a greater effort to manifest that love in all its purity and power in our dealings with our fellow men. May our love for our beloved Master, so ardent, so disinterested in all its aspects, find its true expression in love for our fellow brethren and sisters in the faith, as well as for all mankind. I assure you, dear friends, that progress in such matters as these is limitless and infinite, and that upon the extent of our achievements along this line, 
will ultimately depend the success of our mission in life. Shoghi Effendi. Isn't that amazing? He went to the mountains for eight months, nine months, and came back and took every Baha'i to the mountaintop with such vision. It's remarkable to think that the, his writing style is almost as mature as anything he's ever written. Isn't that right? That there's no, you don't see any arc of development or change in his writing style. He comes back somehow having found he had no reflexes. He couldn't take the reins of the cause of God. For nine months he abandoned the cause of God. But somehow in meditation and sensory deprivation and finding vision on the mountains, he found the vision and the strength to come back and take the reins of the cause of God. Every single principle that we talked about in these three lectures, Shoghi Effendi did in those eight months. And if you read more of it, you would have found he did every single of those things. It seems that the manifestations of God and Shoghi Effendi, even they need to get away and find the spiritual world. All the manifestations of God did something similar. If they need to do it, if they need to do it, how much more do we need to do it? We think that, oh, they could just do it. No. They had to find room 47B too. And it was hard for them. And Riyakunim says that the most wonderful thing is that in 1957, just before Shoghi Effendi died, he went back to those mountains. And she said it was as if the mountains called him. And so the vision of Shoghi Effendi for me from now on the frame of reference of Shoghi Effendi will forever be linked to his going to the mountaintop and then bringing us to there. Now, it's a strange way for me to finish this talk, but I find that if you want to change your frame of reference, if you want to find the spiritual world, you could find it in this first year of Shoghi Effendi's life. Go back and read it. It's, a, it's in Priceless Pearl, the early part of it. And you can find that everything that he did, you can do. Obviously, you can't be the guardian. But in our own way, we need to find our vision. We need to go to our mountaintop, as Shoghi Effendi did. And so I'm hoping that this brief three lectures has given you some change of a frame of reference, some vision of what you can do. But... If we had more time, I would have talked more about some of the things Baha'u'llah said. In fact, Baha'u'llah identified 25 things you can do. Didn't I say that? And where did he identify those 25 things? In the kitab Khan, where he says, Oh, my brother, when the true seeker determines to take a path of search, he must before all else. And then he lists them. And I, I took them and I had 25 things. If I'd had more time, I would have listed those 25 things. But then he goes on to say, Do those 25 things. But it is in proportion to the eagerness of your search that you can, you can achieve these things. In proportion to the eagerness of your search. So you can find room 47B and you can see that gorilla, but you need to have enthusiasm and eagerness. And I hope that all of us can make this journey. So thank you very much.